what is the upper limit of success for Rainmaker? It's like a garden planet is what it looks like. Uh, a, an earth that is more habitable and more biodiverse and more lush than it ever has been as long as humanity has been on the face of it. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Augustus here with me. Uh, I thought a great place to start the conversation is you want to control the weather. That seems absurd, but other countries do this and maybe the United States is actually behind. So first of all, like, what do you mean control the weather? And then what are other countries doing? Totally, totally. So not want to, but am and inevitably will more is the plan. Um, what controlling the weather means practically in the steps that and in the stages that Rainmaker's at now is precipitation enhancement. So you look anywhere in the American West, lots of places all over the world, but let's stick to say California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah. We don't have enough fresh water for the populations that we have as it is. We don't have enough fresh water for the ecosystems that have existed there historically. We don't have enough fresh water for the agriculture that so much of the country relies on and so much of the nations that rely on our exports to rely on. And so if we don't produce more, we're host, right? Like we'll have a Dust Bowl 2.0 situation. That's a big problem. Um, but the conversation around how to solve the water scarcity problem in the West is either, you know, let's spend $100 billion on desal, which is insane, or, and, and I'm all for like mega projects, right? But like, you need so much political capital, you need so much literal capital. It's just a very expensive way to move water around, right? To take it from the ocean, desalinate it, pump it over mountains, maintain the pumps, maintain the pipes. Um, and then on the flip side, there's people that just say like, well, you know, the agriculture has gone. Sorry, guys, like no more Las Vegas, no more Tucson, no more Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and so I found a way or I found some technology that's existed for 70 years um, in a very nascent and crude form um, to enhance precipitation um, in the form of rain or snow um, and make it such that we just have more rain that we have in the last 10 years and, and more rain that we have had historically over the entire American West. So precipitation enhancement is the sort of weather mod that we're starting with. Um, there's all sorts of varied applications that people, you know, sci-fi writers have written about for a long time that cloud seeding has been applied to. So for instance, um, in Calgary, in Canada and in Alberta, people suppress hail all the time um, via these cloud seeding operations. Um, and then, you know, practically what that means, how does this work is important. How do you make it rain more? How do you make it hail less? Um, simply put, there are some clouds that with radar or in situ probes, you can detect the amount of water in. Um, if they're above a threshold point, right, where there's enough water that's below zero degrees Celsius, right, because sometimes there's more water being convected up into the cloud than is being frozen, um, and you can detect that in radar. If you can find them, then you can fly a drone up into them, spray a mineral, that has a crystalline structure that's similar to ice, and then have that water freeze around the mineral. Um, if that happens, then you can freeze the ice crystals into big enough, heavy enough ones such that they fall and melt back down as rain. And we're talking like infinitesimally small amounts of this mineral. It's called silver iodide. That's what's conventionally used. Um, and so Rainmaker right now is seeding over a farm in the Central Valley. We're deploying to ski resorts now, um, deploying to more farms, and then potentially going to be doing some hail suppression in Texas later this year. So when the cloud is there, you guys are literally driving a radar truck yes. out into like a field or a street. You're saying, hey, where are the clouds? Where's the water in the clouds? And then you're taking a drone and you're flying it into the cloud. Correct. And then dropping off a chemical mm -hmm. and that's making it rain. Correct. Correct. That's insane. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, many have said it's like Twister. Many are saying that <laughs> uh, it feels that way. So. Let's maybe go through the drones themselves. Are these like off the shelf drones? Are these like commercial, like industrial drones? Like, like what type of drone goes there? And can you just buy one off the shelf or do you have to like modify them? So we work really closely with one particular company for a boutique system. Um, there's a lot of considerations that you have. Like, can you get to the altitudes that are necessary? Sometimes that's as high as like 20,000 feet, right? Can you get into severe sub freezing conditions? Um, can you fly through the worst icing conditions imaginable, right? Because the clouds with the most water that's below zero degrees Celsius are the worst for icing, like commercial airliners avoid them altogether, but they're the best for seating. Um, so we we buy them from another company, but have a partnership with them to do some modifications as necessary. Um, what other countries do is retrofit military drones, for example, right? So like uh, retrofitted by car drones, uh, the Turkish military drones are used 
in the UAE for cloud seeding. Um, I forget the name of uh, the Chinese drone that's used, but it used to have rockets on it. They now put cloud seeding flares on it. Um, and so you can do relatively small things. Ours is an eight foot wingspan drone. Um, if you want to seed over, you know, entire regional watersheds with one system rather than say 90 square miles, then you have to transition to a, a bigger platform. So when this drone, I mean, eight feet wide wingspan is pretty mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. right? So when this is going up, is it just hitting one cloud and you're like, you know, kind of a sniper and all of a sudden it rains everywhere? Or do you have to go cloud by cloud and like whichever cloud is right over this specific area, it's going to rain there. But let's say I had a couple acres, you know, if I'm on the west side of the acreage, I got to go to the east side to be able to hit those clouds as well. Or like, mm -hmm. how, how does it work in terms of the, maybe the precision at which the rain falls and you're able to, you know, dictate that. Totally. So, so you can cover an area of uh, about a 90, 90 mile radius circle. Um, so pretty, pretty large coverage over like multiple municipalities. But the question of how precise the uh, projection of rain falling is, is interesting. So right now, um, Nobody has done this before. Rainmaker is currently trying to get down to like 10,000 acres of precision. Um, historically, it's like, you know, tens of miles, right? Just because you have a plane flying 100 miles an hour up there, we fly 40, trying to be a little bit more precise, um, disperse more of the chemical in, in the right regions of the cloud. Um, anything less than 10,000 acres, though, you know, if you have a cloud that's, say, 10,000 feet up, you have so much variation in the wind that's falling beneath that. It's it's hard to project. It's just a trigonometry problem, right? Like how far does it have to go down? How far does it have to go this way from the wind? Um, but it becomes hard to project uh, any onto, it's hard to project reliably onto any smaller target than 10,000 acres. So large scale commercial farm, ski resorts, um, you know, municipal watersheds for uh, their reservoirs, that kind of thing is all pretty precise. And I think that we can lever up over time to to become better if we're modeling this better, if we're identifying the appropriate conditions better. You know, nobody's applied um, like machine learning applications to, or there's very little in the way of uh, machine learning applied to meteorological considerations just because uh, meteorology hasn't been that sexy. And so the best talent has gone elsewhere. Now, Google made GraphCast just recently, which was a great model for this. But um, you know, if, if we can draw more of the best talent in both physics, chemistry, AI, then um, I think that we'll easily be able to, one, up the precision, but two, up the yields of our precipitation enhancement, um, and then probably develop some other other products like hail suppression, et cetera. So the people who are the detractors, the critics, uh, maybe they don't like your mullet, maybe they don't like other things, but like, what are their complaints? You think someone doesn't like my mullet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think that uh, they're like, see, I told you, I knew that that's the type yes, of person that would yes. be doing this, right? What is he really up to? Totally. But like, what, what are the critics? What are they? Uh, yeah. So, what are they yelling about? So there's there's three there's three considerations. Um, the first of which is like, you know, I removed my phone number from the website because I was getting phone calls that were saying like, "Hey, man, I see the chemtrails over the airport, man," and it was like. First of all, not me. Second of all, those are probably contrails, probably not, probably not the chemtrails you think they are. So there's that category of complaint, which is just like you're, you know, uh, polluting the skies or something like this that are more or less unbased. Um, then there's a, a valid consideration, which is, OK, you're admitting to spraying a mineral, a chemical into clouds that are precipitating. That mineral is then getting into the watershed. Should we be worried about this? Um, the way to address that one is, is in the following manner. So silver iodide, um, that's what we use. That's the crystal that has the similar structure to ice. Um, it's not fat soluble. It's not water soluble. So if it gets into your system, you expel it very quickly. That's the first consideration. The second thing is in the continental U.S., four parts per million of the soil is silver itself. After a seeding operation, um, a relatively robust concentrated one, you add about 80 parts per trillion. So significant orders of magnitude less than what's already latent in the soil. Now, the reason why that's relevant is the primary concern about silver iodide is that it is silver, so it has antimicrobial properties. Um, we're significantly below, even after years of seeding over the same area, uh, the threshold amount of silver necessary to be um, you know, undercutting watersheds, uh, natural bacteria. So there's, there's that consideration too. Nevertheless, Rainmaker is still engaged in research for even more uh, robust 
efficient and environmentally safe uh, nucleation agents. So we started experimenting with those. There's a handful of good candidates that I think will roll out by the end of the year. Um, but, you know, for the longest time, silver iodide has been quite safe. Um, then there's the third consideration. So there's, you know, just like the general chemtrail angst. There's the genuine and sophisticated angst about um, particular minerals in the watershed. And then there's the question of like, this is God's domain. You know not how to control the weather. Um, and and they're, they're worried about us modifying the weather in such a way that would have, you know, unforeseen second, third, nth order consequences. Um, the first thing to think about there is like, well, one, we've been unintentionally modifying the weather for, I don't know, 100 plus, 150 years, give or take, right? Like basically since... Uh, we've had the Industrial Revolution. These smokestacks that we have are emitting particulate into the atmosphere all the time. There's this really cool study in Poland uh, observing on radar the precipitation in the tracks downwind of a coal plant. Um, and they just basically have a river in the sky all the time because they're emitting so much steam and coal there. So we're already modifying the weather unintentionally. Um, so really, this is not so different than most human activity. Um, but then the second consideration is, okay, you know, it is something to be wary of when you're playing with ecosystems. Um, we should model out the consequences of our intervention to like a large and robust degree. Um, and we should figure out like, okay, if this cloud is not going to be positive sum when seeded, like if we're not producing more water for everybody, then we should refrain from doing so. Um, now, the, the problem is this is the frontier, right? There is a component of this that is as yet untested. Um, and so we don't know what the nth order effects will be despite our best efforts to model them out. What we do know though, is that in the status quo, on the track we're going, um, we're going to see ecological collapse in the entire Colorado River watershed and Delta. Um, we're going to see the agricultural collapse of the Central Valley, all of our pistachios, all of our almonds, all of our citrus, all of the crops that the rest of the world relies on America exporting, um, they may see famine from uh, not having any longer. And so um, if you want to continue to live in Salt Lake City, if you want to continue to live in Los Angeles, you know the status quo is non-viable. Um, the question is then, do you prefer one where we know, a future where we know that uh, we're all going to have less food and less biodiversity and lower population cities in the American West and lots of things and people are going to die? Or do you want to take a calculated and cautious risk with a new technology that may have unintended consequences, but also has the prom promise of a potentially abundant future? Um, that one is the one, th this, this third question that people have is the one that I like talking about most because um, it gets down to the crux of this really big issue of our time, which is, you know, growth versus degrowth, abundance versus scarcity. Um, I don't want to have no possessions and be happy, right? Like I want to own space and grow things and give my children an inheritance and make more value and produce more for other people in my nation and society. Um, and so uh, th those are the questions that people generally ask. In the growth versus degrowth debate, um are there potential solutions from a degrowth perspective for these problems? Like are the critiques complemented with suggestions or like potential other solutions, or is it pretty much like, Hey, this is a problem. We don't like your solution, but we don't have a better idea. Mm. There are a lot of ways to make water use more efficient that I'm entirely in favor of. Right. So switching from flood to drip irrigation, for example, that that's a great easy layup to reduce agricultural explain water. what that is for people yeah so so flood irrigation there's a handful of different ways to irrigate but basically you can just dump water over an entire field right or you can have a conventional sprinkler that sprays it all over the place um a lot of that water then say like say that you have a row of pistachio trees if you have a conventional sprinkler you know a lot of that water is going to end up three feet away from the roots of the tree um that's not a very efficient way to irrigate Drip irrigation is basically just the laying of these lines in the ground um, with holes punctured in them just at the base of the tree. So you get very, very targeted, slow drips of water. Not lots of the water evaporates because it's coming out so slowly. Um, you know, that can reduce agricultural uh, water demand like 50 to 80 percent, um, depending on the crop, depending on the region. So that is something that we should do. Um, the trouble is in this conversation, like whether 
you launder quality of life reductions um, into the conversation. So if there was, say, a state subsidy for farmers to switch from conventional irrigation to drip, totally in favor of this. Um, should we compel farmers that are already operating on a razor thin margin to tear up all their irrigation, not be able to grow for a season, and then pay more to install new stuff? No, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. So yes, efficiency measures are good. Yes, I think we should adopt them. Um, barring like 60 minute showers, I'm not giving that up. <laughs> um, why did the United States stop doing this? Because you mentioned that this technology has been around for 70 years or so. We invented it. We invented cloud seeding. Yeah, in 1946, 1947, these guys, you know, were doing some unrelated cloud physics experiments in a cloud chamber, spilled some dry ice and silver iodide in a box, saw the super cooled liquid freeze and then precipitate to the bottom. They're like, well, you know, why don't we just try this in real life? Like, so they got in their plane and flew over Western New York and started hucking it out the back and induced the first man-made snowstorm. Um, crazy, right? No, wait, 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 hold on. They literally did it in a lab first by accident. By total, total accident, yeah. And then they literally got in a plane and just like opened up the door or something and started throwing it out? Exactly. Well, it was, it wasn't covered. It wasn't covered. It was like an open top, wow. yeah, sort of like World War One style yeah. situation. And that created the world's first man-made snowstorm. Correct. Correct. Okay. So that sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. Spectacular. Why did we stop? Um, so, so like we ripped on cloud seeding from like 1940 to like the early 1980s. Like there were precipitation enhancement projects all over the country. There was something called Project Skyfire. By the way, the names of cloud seeding projects are always awesome. <laughs> um, Project Skyfire was trying to do wildfire suppression in California from cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. Um, we had Project Storm Fury trying to bust hurricanes over the Atlantic before they broke against the eastern seaboard. Explain how that works. Yeah, so um, there's two considerations. So you have this, this hurricane in the Atlantic. Um, freezing, ice freezing is an exothermic reaction, right? Okay. So it releases heat because you have water with a given energy. It, it releases that energy when it binds together. Um, if you seed the hurricane, um, one thing that happens is water precipitates down out of it. And so there's less flooding that could occur from uh, the hurricane after it's been seeded. But the second thing is because it's releasing this heat, you expand the uh, area of the storm, um, which then reduces the velocities of the wind. So you get less damage from the hurricane winds when it breaks against the shore. And also there's something to be said about potentially uh, changing the direction of it. Um, but that is uh a science that is even more frontier than yet Rainmaker is engaged in. So l let's talk about that science. Um, yeah. If a hurricane is coming, mm -hmm. you're basically saying you could disperse it, mm -hmm. right? Kind of kill the hurricane. That sounds interesting. I think that uh, we had a former president who talked about throwing a nuclear bomb, yes. if I remember correctly. Yes, we did. We did, yeah. And I don't know if he was joking or not, but like mm -hmm. similar idea, but maybe we don't need the nuclear bomb to you know be able yeah, to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but why would you want to turn it? Yeah, yeah. Rather um, than break it up, is there well, it, it, other the, use cases? The, the, fir the first consideration is, um, you can imagine other use cases, but no, the first consideration is uh, maybe the requisite amount of energy that you can release from cloud seeding um, with a given storm, you know, Cat 5, whatever it may be, uh, is too, too great given the technology we have to totally right. disperse it. Um, so turning it is like the second best option rather than breaking it yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then maybe still like you want the hurricane to deposit some of the water, like, like, uh, the Midwest gets a lot of water from hurricanes that flow inland. Mm -hmm. Now they destroy Louisiana, um, and they destroy Miami, but maybe if you can reduce its velocity, redirect it towards the central coast instead of Miami when it's at its you know absolute worst, um, this is very speculative, but, uh, that's something that you might want to do to ensure that you still get the precipitation inland. How do you think about the morality of like the hurricane has a path, like, you know, God's path, let's call it. Uh -huh. If you turn it, I think people would say, Hey, it's going to hit humans. Now we're going to send it over the ocean. It's going to disperse on its own. Like, okay, makes sense. But like, do we ever get into a situation where we're like picking and choosing who gets hit with the hurricane? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like oh, this city has better funding or something, right? They're going to turn it and this other city doesn't have a cloud seeding program or technology or something. And so like they bear the brunt, but this city saved themselves. Like, do we get into a weird how we make these decisions? Well, so I, I think a lot about weather modification as an analog to like our AI discussion okay. or our, you know, nuclear weapons discussion. Um, I am extremely grateful to 
be responsible for Rainmaker, um, be responsible to some extent for like the burgeoning, burgeoning researching to cloud seeding. Um, in the same way that any useful technology can be used for good or bad, um, in the same way that you know either the United States can steward AI or the CCP can steward AI, um, this is true of weather modification. Uh, you can either have you know rogue nations, rogue powers um, that are exclusively taking you know bids from the highest bidder that motivate them to uh, seed in this area or another, which you know might be wrought with ethical considerations. Um, I don't think by any stretch I'm a perfect man. Um, I think that I'm you know a sinner before God day in and day out, and I pray and repent for that. Um, but I am grateful that with what limited moral ability I have, uh, you know, my team and I can make decisions about where it is appropriate to see and where it's not. And so, for example, um, if the question as it stands now, and it's something to be thought about more is, you know, are we going to choose who gets hit by a hurricane? The, the answer is like, hold on. No, no, that's not where we're at. Um, we don't even have the capability to do that for one. But then another consideration is, you know, with respect to cloud seeding, is a cloud that we see going to be purely positive sum? Um, if the answer is no, then we, we don't engage in that right now because uh, we exclusively want to provide more. We don't want to have to deal with making decisions about who gets what. Um, and so, you know, the, the moral and ethical considerations around cloud seeding matter a lot. And um, I'm grateful that like flawed man though I am, I'm in America. I have moral confidence that I can lean on that uh, can help me make better decisions about where we're operating what would be a negative consequence? So if it's not completely net positive, like what would be some of the like other considerations as to, hey, we know that there is precipitation that potentially could come from this cloud, but we're going to stand down because of these other considerations? Well, so for one, you know, say we've had these, we had this atmospheric river recently in California, um, tons of water deposited from it. That was great. Um, but the soil was saturated. A lot of the reservoirs became full. Uh, if you precipitate more water out of the residual clouds that aren't raining naturally after the atmospheric river, then you may be liable for flooding, right? Like, because the, the water can't, there the ground can't take any more water. Um, and so we pass on opportunities like that. Or, you know, maybe a cloud is known or is strongly, very likely to precipitate over, uh, say, town A, but you could induce precipitation in it prior in town B. Um, we're not choosing between one place and another mm -hmm. to, to precipitate. It's exclusively clouds that would not otherwise that are of interest to us. So is there like a, you know, the big cloud that got away, right? Like, <laughs> like I kind of feel like, do you like lay in bed and you're like, the man, I, dick. yeah, like I can't wait to find the big cloud, right? Like, like Dude. How, how do you think about the cloud and the quality and, and like how much water is there like something that you chase and uh, I almost think of it like a tornado chaser. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's oh, my like, God, yeah. I saw the big one. Right. Like, is, is the same thing exist in the clouds? Yeah. Yeah. So it does. So, <laughs> um, dude, and the funny thing is uh, in, you know, the Central Valley, California, you, like I said, you need clouds that are below zero degrees Celsius. So below 32 Fahrenheit. Um, the higher the altitude you go, generally speaking, the colder it gets. Um, our drone can only go so high. Right. And we're only permitted by the FAA to go so high. Um but uh, at night, it gets colder. So the freezing layer descends. So, you know, delirious though we are from like 11 p.m. to like 6 a.m. every day out on the farm, um, like we find some really, really juicy clouds. And I can really explain what that means, but um, that like come down at like two kilometers. Usually these things are like up at three or four or five and, you know, they're out of reach of the drone. You couldn't even imagine getting them if, if you could, if you wanted to. Um, but some will come down real low and then it's like, man, are they teasing that's you? one that, yes, 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 exactly. You hear the whispers um, <laughs> of the, of the drizzle and the wind. Um, and then you can see on radar, you know, whether there's a, a freezing layer, um, the particulars don't matter. It's say, call it like a dendritic growth zone. Basically you have super cold liquid water and uh, frozen ice crystals, dendrites, right? Like the long, the long varieties of ice crystals. Um, you can see when when supercooled liquid water is freezing into those uh, because the variability in the particle shape you can detect on radar. And so like, that's when you know, like this sucker's full. Um, and so we've seen some of those at really low altitudes that we've tried to hit. 
Um, and then like our atomizer, the thing that sprayed the chemical clogged or something like this, or like mm. the battery died or something like this. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's been many a Moby Dick sighting that the team and I have dealt with. What about like commercial uh, flights? You, you and I have talked previously about like uh, the icing, right? That like mm-hmm. that should probably go away. But also, um, could you stop the rain? So rather than make it rain, could you stop the rain so that flights could take off? Uh, it could be just sunnier and nicer for some people. Um, is there benefit from like a plane flying ahead of a commercial plane and kind of like clearing the path, right? Mm. Like, like what are the relationships to commercial flights? Yeah, so there's this thing called uh, the Tuomi effect, right? So um, in, in the case of cloud seeding, you want to introduce a little bit more aerosol than what's naturally occurring so that the water can aggregate around and freeze around it. Um, and then become heavy enough to precipitate. If you spray lots and lots, actually still like grams, right? But rather than, you know, hundredths of grams, grams. Um, if you spray more aerosol, then you can get the water to bind to those aerosols still, but in such small forms, right? So like think of it, if you have 100 water droplets um, and one aerosol, then you get one really big water particle, one really big ice crystal. But if you have 100 water droplets, and 100 aerosol particles, then you get 100 really small ice crystals. Um, and they've never become heavy enough to fall. And so one thing that you can do is you can prevent precipitation in certain areas or like prevent hail, for example, by uh, overseeding. So the Tuomi effect is like if you have lots and lots of aerosols, will that prevent large droplets from forming? So entirely possible to do hail suppression. So if you're an insurance company, right, that's worried about hail destroying, you know, 20 square miles of property in Houston or in anywhere in the Bible Belt, um, then like you can you can pay for cloud seeding to mitigate that risk. Um, like I said, in Calgary and Alberta, people do this already for crops. Um, in North Dakota, they do this as well. Um, and uh, you know, blizzard suppression, that's definitely something to consider. Icing condition suppression, like sometimes it's not even precipitating, but you have clouds that are too dangerous to fly through in the vicinity of the airport. Um, you could seed that locally or you could disperse fog locally um, and definitely like keep airport uptime uh, higher. So you're using drones right now. Could you use like, I don't know, uh, mortar tubes or like uh, some sort of like howitzer or something to like shoot with more precision rather than have to fly the drone? This is this is a long term dream of mine. Pump. Yes. Is it possible? Yo, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, entirely. Entirely. So. When, when I was, was at the, the Weather Weather Modification Association conference in April, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know it exists. It's in yeah. Las Vegas this year. If you want to meet me at the Weather Mod conference, um, <laughs> I'll see you uh, in April. Um, but uh, when I was there, is that run by like the CIA? Is run- <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like, like right? yeah, yeah, like yeah, what, yeah. What, what's going on there? No, it's, it's strictly Bohemian Grove attendees that get to go. Got it. Um, yeah. yeah, robes <laughs> chanting. <clears throat> um, we. Uh, Dude, there was this Romanian company. Okay. And like everybody presents like a bunch of different researchers companies. They're like, yes, I don't know how to do a Romanian accent. I'm not going to. They were like, yeah, we increased precipitation 30% with rockets. And we're like, what? They're like, yeah, we have these um, huge Soviet era warehouses full of rockets. And we're just replacing the munitions on them with uh, silver iodide. And we're blasting them into clouds. And they're like, what? Okay, first of all, can you show, do you have any data? Like, how, what were your methods? And they were like, no, 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 no. We're blasting rockets into clouds. It's none of your business, American, okay? Like, trust me, it really? works. Yeah, 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 it was awesome. Um, so they're doing that all over Transylvania. So, and again, I'm going to get very quickly out of my technical depth here, but uh, if you shoot the rocket, you've taken out the ammunition, you've put the silver iodide, mm-hmm. uh, how do you get the silver iodide to kind of come out, right, and be exposed at the right time? Cause it, cause isn't it inside of like a, like the, the rocket shell? Yeah. So it's, it's like, a, it's like a warhead actually still of silver iodide. Got it. So it's like on the front end almost. Yeah. And so yeah. when it hits the cloud, then mm-hmm. it, it kind of like gets activated and yes. knows like it's party time. Today's episode is brought to you by Supra. If you're building anything in web three or crypto, you likely need oracles and verifiable randomness too. Supra's offering the fastest oracles and DVRF free for 12 months at supra.com slash pomp for a limited time. Super delivers the freshest Oracle price feeds across 50 plus blockchains. Be it current critical price levels or liquidation triggers, beat your competition to the punch with Supra. It's as good as having the first mover advantage on every price update. 
Supra is more secure, easier to integrate, and runs on up to 12x lower gas per feed than other Oracles. So you'll want to bank on this 12 months free offer as soon as possible. If you're just listening and know any builders, you can earn $1,500 by letting them know about this deal. They can get the fastest oracles for free for 12 months, and you get $1,500 for every referral. Visit supra.com slash pomp to learn more. That's S-U-P-R-A dot com slash pomp. Uh, yeah. Yeah, essentially. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what they're doing. Um, Are we going to try this? You know what's funny, actually? The ATF regulations around model rockets are way more liberal than the FAA regulations around drones. Um, so, yeah. Oh, you just want to do a model rocket? You can make a big model rocket, Pom. I know somebody who has a howitzer. You 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 do? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. We'll talk yeah, I'm pretty about sure that's that. what they have. All right, sweet. Yeah, yeah. I, we should talk about that for sure. Because okay. cloud cannons. I didn't, I didn't, I've never even thought about this, but yeah, like a cloud. I haven't talked to you about this? No. Dude, so one of, one of my friends. Um, a cloud cannon say, just sounds awesome. I know. <laughs> yeah, like paint it white, put it up in the mountain. One of my friends, he, he did a bunch of like war dog contracting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I was first starting this company, I was like, well, the unit economics actually make more sense for like a howitzer, but I don't know how to get one. So like, I'll probably do drones. And he was like, oh, like, let me connect you to the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, he did, and the Army Corps was like, what, what are you talking about? Get out of here. Like, who are you? How did you get an introduction to us? And then, and then I went back to my friend. I was like, yeah, they weren't into it. Um, and he goes, okay, I know a guy in Turkey. Like, do you want to go to Turkey to go get some artillery? And I was like, uh, really? And he was like, yeah, like, you might have to go to Syria to pick it up. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> fine. I don't need that right now. I saw the movie. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. So passed on the howitzer for now. But let's, uh, let's talk about your guy. So, so you think that it's possible, though? Entirely. Yeah. And, yeah. and it would be probably more efficient, lower cost. And you probably could actually, well, maybe you, you wouldn't have as much coverage uh, as a drone, because a drone could, you know, travel. But uh, if you knew where you were going, well, from generally, the start generally, what what you yeah. have relatively predictable weather patterns year to year. Like you're you're generally going to get the same sort of westerly flow from the Pacific over the Central Valley and then the Sierras, right? Mm -hmm. And so, what you could do for like real large scale weather mod infrastructure is in the vicinity of your areas of interest, where you know that like on a 10th through 90th percentile a year, this is where you're going to get your atmospheric rivers. Um, you install those, those cloud cannons there, induce precipitation at the tops of the watersheds of the areas of interest, um, and then just have this as like a constant water supply strategy rather than, you know, right now, Rainmaker, we're doing a one-off project here, a one-off project there, seeding through the season. Like water's a public good. Mm -hmm. Legislators, regulators, governors, they should be thinking about how to increase supply in their states. Um, and that in part probably means weather modification to increase the supply in the watershed, right? Especially in the West where, you know, there's no groundwater left and everybody's paying through the nose and penalties for overdraft. Yeah. Um, now, now, this said, by the way, we didn't circle back to why we stopped, why we stopped cloud seeding. Yeah. Because like the state of California used to sponsor tons of it. Idaho used to sponsor tons of it. They're actually still pretty good. Um, but like, why is it that China spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year and has 38,000 people employed in the Beijing Weather Modification Office when we have like, and listen, dudes rock. I've got eight guys on my team. We're killing it. Um, but that that ratio is pretty David and Goliath, right? Eight um, eight people versus 38,000? Yeah. I like our odds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's a crazy consideration. Um, and there's some great researchers in addition to, to what Rainmaker is doing, like at the uh, at universities across the country. But um, why, why are we in this precarious situation now when control of the weather is something that probably should be within like the American scope of technological capability, um, but isn't at all now? Um, the first thing is, you know, practically speaking, nobody had solved the attribution problem, meaning you know, we know that in a cloud chamber, if you sprinkle some of these magic beans, then it precipitates water out. Um, but clouds are super dynamic. Um, can you prove really that your intervention created more rain that would, than would, would have naturally occurred, right? Um, nobody had been able to do that. Statistical analyses of like rain gauges here, rain gauges there, they're not great because maybe you'd get more rain in the next valley, but um, you see it in this one, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just kind of rough. Um, in 2017 through 2021, though, 
there's still research coming out from this project. Um, there was a project in Idaho where they realized if you take really high resolution radar and follow the path of your plane, in our case drone, you can measure the phase change of supercooled water, uh, liquid water into ice, and then watch that precipitate down to the ground. Um, and so we solved definitively like, okay, where, where are the tracks of precipitation that's exclusively anthropogenic and how much did we precipitate? So solving that problem made this tech way more commercializable. Um, the second problem is like, you know, planes uh, are pretty expensive to have on call 24 7, 365. The way we disperse the chemicals is pretty expensive. Um, the yields were pretty low because we were kind of just like, like doing. Hope we get it. Yeah, very like artisanal meteorology. Um, so it was just too expensive for, you know, most states to justify paying for almost all municipalities, certainly all farms. Um, and so you need to lower the cost curve like one or two orders of magnitude and increase the yields two or three orders of magnitude to make this, um, you know, what it should be. Um, so those two practical reasons, like the technological and commercial aside, there's also just the the philosophical one, which is, um, you know, I think that as a nation, as a civilization, we've lost faith. We've lost faith in ourselves, um, in our institutions, in our ability to do great things. Um, you know, Isaiah Taylor was on here. He's talking about his 10 year plan to make energy 10 times cheaper, right? Like that is the sort of vision that I think people used to have that people need to have if we're going to, you know, right the ship, so to speak. Um, and so Rainmaker, sure, we're going to mitigate droughts. That's part of the plan. Sure. We're going to provide precipitation to farms, but really like making earth habitable in a way that it never before has been for humanity and symbiotically all of nature is the vision, right? Like terraforming the deserts on the planet, extending the Great Plains through West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California so that all of that land is more biodiverse and arable. Um, doing the same with like the deserts in Australia, with the deserts in the Sahara, preventing hurricanes from doing unnecessary damage to our coasts. This is the sort of future that you have to envision dream up and then drag into a very practical reality um with like technological backbone um and then like the grit to go stand out in the rain from 11 p.m to 6 a.m um for the sake of seeing it to fruition like i think that that sort of vision is something that people don't have anymore and um you know some simple solutions are like one just do it like just believe that you can do it um two probably go to the gym um, and this is like, dude, changed my life, changed my life to actually do that because you can see the linear relationship between effort and output, um, going to church, right? Like I think that having faith in God, um, rather than being purely grounded in scientific materialism and nihilism, that lends itself towards a higher vision for the future. Um, and then, you know, like get a gang together, get a gang of people that also have the same ambition and vision. And like, you will as we have in the gundo, like feed off one another's energy to do great things. What's going on there? I explain like, how did this all come together? And uh, people see the memes on the internet, but like what's actually happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, in a certain sense, you know, uh, have you watched Hamilton? Have you seen the, the musical Hamilton? No. So there's a song in Hamilton called The Story of Tonight. Okay. Um, I think that, that that whole musical soundtrack is really resonant with Gen Z people, but it's like The Story of Tonight, which is like, um, here's a toast to the four of us tomorrow. There'll be more of us. It's like this song of a bunch of guys that are in the revolutionary war that met at a bar and like, what were the chances that they'd all revolutionaries that they were meet at the bar and, yep. and they're toasting to more of them tomorrow. Um, you know, in a certain sense, El Segundo has had iterations of this sort of like upstart revolutionary hard tech culture. Um, SpaceX was there, you know, um, we're trying, no, I can't say that. Um, other companies, prominent defense companies have been founded there. Um, and, uh, and so it's natural that because of that ecosystem of talent that other startups, you know, kind of have come and went, but in the last year it's blown up. Um, there are people doing all sorts of technology in defense, loitering munitions, ISR platforms, advanced manufacturing, multiple different nuclear energy companies, um, weather modification, right? There's these guys that run a company called Shinke Systems. Have you heard of this? No. Dude, auto fish killing robots. Um, so like if you have a fishing ship, they have like a hungry, hungry hippos machine that like sort of drags the fish off deck, orients them, stabs them in the brain, kills them very precipitously so that you get like one, a more humane death for the fish and then two, like higher quality meat. Um, but all these people 
oh, uh, Kappa One, crazy company. These guys are making stratospheric soaring drones. So like they go up to 60,000 feet and then have a map of the convection that's going on in the stratosphere and they can find thermal updrafts and then stay up in the air for days and weeks. Um, it's incredible technology. And so, you know, it's kind of just been like this gravi gravity well where, you know, one guy showed up and then he started building something awesome and we all had a good time at the bar afterwards or something. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning at the lab again. Um, and, and it's just been accelerating where more and more people are showing up to build exclusively great companies. Um, I think there's one software company in the Gundo, sadly. Um, but, uh, you want to kick them out? No, they're fine. But like, no more, no more. Definitely not. Um, uh, they're good guys. Um, they're the shift guys, uh, or SIFT, one of the two, I don't know, software. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's just like a, a group of extremely dedicated, extremely rigorous uh, hard tech folks that um, Bridget Mendler included in that, by the way, you saw this. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, big, big. Um, <laughs> that are uh, relentlessly trying to have a good time building like 22nd century technology. Are, are the drones with explosives that company's in there? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That one's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, I saw it. Do you see the video? Uh, I don't think it's them. I think it was a different yeah. company, but the guy, uh, who's like hiding under a tank running around the tank. And then all of a sudden he sees the drone and he's like, Oh shit, I've been found. And he runs around the tank and the drone comes and blows him up. Yes. Like that yes. is 21st century modern warfare. Totally. Totally. Yeah. 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 Pretty nuts. Um, all right. So what is China doing? 38,000 people in weather modification. I'm suspect. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <What>? Peculiar. <laughs> what are they doing? What are they up to? Dude, I mean, in, in a certain sense, it's it's uh, hard to say because they're so opaque about their mm -hmm. research and data. Like mm -hmm. American universities, national labs, we basically just like give everybody everything for mm -hmm. free. Um, what we do know big, that Big doing, debate in the AI world right now. Should we be open sourcing some of this stuff? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. see many people that I respect and like on the internet all getting in tizzies with each other over know, should it be open source or should it not? Especially with, you know, the two feuding kings, Sam yeah. and Elon. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. open or closed AI. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rename it and he'll drop the suit, Sam. <laughs> uh, I have no allegiance to either of them. Um, but SpaceX was started in El Segundo. Uh, so, so yeah, what, what China is doing with 38,000 people, they, um, they explicitly and openly are one like for their sporting events. Oh, this is another crazy application of weather modification. You know, the phrase like, don't rain on my parade. Yeah. It, it doesn't rain on parades in China. Like it doesn't rain on parades because they just disperse all the precipitation beforehand. Like this is an obvious, awesome application. That's what I meant about like, could you make it not rain? Yeah. Like basically yeah, yeah. you could just make it rain before, I you guess. You could make it yeah. rain before, or if you wait over to see the cloud, you could you could uh, reduce the probability of precipitation during. Interesting. Yeah, so either way. Yeah. So yeah, like the, the 2008 Olympics, everybody talks about this. They precipitated all the water out before the Olympic games. Um, mm -hmm. You can do that. They do that. Russia does that. Um, Russia also has much smaller, but like a, a large weather mod program. Um, they're also doing hydroelectric and agricultural watershed supplementation. So like on the Yangtze river, tons and tons of rice production, um, hydroelectric water production too. They were experiencing droughts though. Um, they since have been experiencing far less because they're producing mm -hmm. more water at the top of that watershed in the river. Um, they're also engaged in an attempt to terraform more of the like inner Mongolian Gobi desert. Um, so they're planting lots of monoculture trees there. They're cloud seeding over it for the sake of supplying more water to the flora that they're planting. Um, there's uh, some storm mitigation that's going on in the south, like in Canton. Um, multiple applications, all of which seem to have outsized positive economic yield for the country. Mm -hmm. um, it's the government that's doing this. Yes. Yeah, it's the state. Yeah, it's well, the state. Is there a lesson in there for us, like private company versus the government or is the United States at a position where the government couldn't even get it out of their own way to do this. And so we need a private company to do it. You know, like I've said this before in a lot of different contexts, I think that for some reason, the two thousands and even early 2010s tech companies decided for some reason to be adversarial with the state and DC. Um, I think that if we're going to in, you know, this now multipolar moment, um, have a thriving tech ecosystem that can support the nation's interests, we need to collaborate in an unprecedented manner, or at least in a way that I have never seen in my lifetime. Um, I think that 
part of what makes America great and what's critical is the fact that private industry can innovate and that the private sector can produce great products. But, um, you know, the Manhattan Project, uh, a lot of the stuff that the DOD has produced or that NASA has produced that was then commercialized, um, that's evidence of the strong state supplying research and funding for these Napoleonic projects. Um, I think that the lesson for us is, one, there should be a private sector for cloud seeding because um, more innovation is going to occur that way. And we don't want like total centralized control in any industry. Um, but it should be in collaboration with states and federal regulators and legislators and governors so that like water, which is a public good, right, is something that they can one, tell their constituents they're providing for them. Um, and two, uh, you know, ensure that like, not just anybody with an airplane and some chemicals mm -hmm. is cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not one to suggest like pulling up the ladder behind you or anything like this. Um, but like, it is something that probably legislators should be thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. There's right now almost nothing that you have to do for permitting for modifying the weather. Like you have to go through NOAA, you have to go through uh, some EPA stuff, you have to go through some FAA stuff, but it's, it's really lightweight. Um, that obviously makes it easier to start a company in the space, but probably makes people more wary about like whether or not the state's being as uh, litigious about permitting. How it. much of that goes away if you use a howitzer versus a drone? You probably get more of it with a howitzer, but with, with, with rockets, you get way less. Rockets, yeah. it's rockets, it's like nothing. Yeah. 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 So like, could you go to, I don't know, Toys R Us or like a, like Radio Shack or, you know, like what, I don't know what store sells like model rockets now, but. So you could, you could do it with solid, solid rocket engines okay. um, for the lower clouds. So like say 3000 to maybe like 7,000 feet you could hit um, with like. That's still pretty high. Oh yeah. 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 Totally dude. I'm thinking like a thousand feet times oh, seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. a lot. It's, okay. I mean, it's like, what is it? 5,280 is a mile. Yeah. So you're, you're going in excess of a mile with some of these things yeah, yeah, with yeah. like a real payload. So, um, so you would probably need something more than just like an off the shelf model rocket. Oh, uh, there's some really big ones that you can buy there. Costs. Okay. Yeah. Like how much do you think they cost? Uh, a couple hundred dollars to like a couple grand. Oh man, that's pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rocket barrage to make it rain. That'd be a cool aesthetic, right? I mean, I'm just imagining a farmer like waking up in the morning, looking at the crops, being like, I need water and just like press a button and just <laughs> yeah, rock yeah, it. Like, yeah. like you've seen the video of SpaceX where it's like uh, the time series. And so, you know, uh, oh, back in launches. like, yeah, yeah, yeah and just yeah, launch yeah. And then all of a sudden it's just like rapid fire. Yep. Like I'm just imagining them just, you know, have little launch pads all over their farm. Inevitable. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, think about it, right? If it's a couple hundred bucks per rocket, would you spend 10K? To make it rain, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. I'm sure. Totally. For a large scale farm. And yeah. there, there's another consideration too, which is like, you know, maybe you've only got a hundred acres. It's too hard to make it rain just over there. But there's irrigation districts and like farming collectives that cover tens of thousands. Yeah. Or like over yeah, you and your boys. Years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Just you and the homies modify the weather locally for the sake of your crop, you know. Yeah. And then everyone has their own rocket. And yep. All right. Uh, how much do you guys get paid for this? Um are you so about to say? Yeah, I can talk, talk about, about the way in which like yeah. we've justified pricing. All right. Um, <laughs> justified pricing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So like how much value are you producing is yeah, the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually probably a pretty hard thing to show across different customers. Across different customer segments for sure. Yeah, Cause yeah, the yeah. ski resort is altogether different than the farm. Yeah. Um, in the case of the farm, let's just talk about this. It's like the one that we've been working with longest that we know the most about um, in all of central California. There are what are called high priority groundwater basins. Um, these are ones where like people are having a hard time getting any water out mm -hmm. in the areas where they can get water out. The basin's being depleted year over year. So the state stepped in and said, you know, you're only allowed to pump so much per year. If you exceed your budget, then we're going to, instead of charging you like, do you know what an acre foot is? Have I told you what an acre no. foot is? So if you covered an acre of water, one foot deep in water, if you've if you covered an acre of land, one foot deep in water, That'd be about 325,851 gallons. That is an acre the foot. unit that people use. Okay. Um, so one foot deep of water over an entire over acre. An acre. Okay. Yeah. Um, that That's just part of the, yeah, farming. I, I, I'm not uh, in the weather modification industry, so I have no opinion. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that just seems hard to keep track of, but okay. Oh, yeah, it's intuitive now. Um, yeah. But uh if so, so the going rate of water in one of these high priority basins when you're below your budget, say like, $10 per acre foot, you can exceed your budget and it can jump up to like 7,000. 
And so $10 to 7,000. Yeah. Wow. That's a big range. Yeah. Yeah. In some cases it's two to 500. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you, you get like a two order of magnitude Delta Mm -hmm. in almost every case. Um, then if you need water to farm, because say you have like an orchard of permanent crops, um, it's not a choice as to whether you're going to pay for the overdraft fees, like your crops will die otherwise, um, or you have to cut them down. So what Rainmaker does is we, we step in, we say, okay, you're paying this much in penalties every month. Um, we can produce this much precipitation, which one will reduce your consumption from the aquifer. So you're going to pay less in penalties that way. But two, the way that they justify your allocation in part depends on how much rain you get because mm-hmm. your rain recharges the, the aquifer too. Um, so we're going to up your supply. And so we'll save you roughly half of the penalties that you pay every year in uh, the, the, the water that we provide and, and we'll charge the difference. Um, in the case of like our first customer, they paid about three quarters of a million dollars every month in overdraft penalties before uh, they started using cloud seeding services instead. Um, and so, and so what you could basically say, Hey, you're going to save, let's say 50% of that, um, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then we want a percentage of what we save you or something. Uh, yeah. So on, on the, in the course of a year, it's like $8 million that they'd pay in penalties. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if we save them half, um, then we charge like 30% total on the 8 million. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad business. No. Yeah. I'm an investor, by the way. I don't know if I said that earlier. I probably should disclose that. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a big, big, big fan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> even more, even more excited now. Um, all right. So, what about the ski resorts? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm assuming if they just have more snow, more people come. Well, so it's not just a question of more snow. It's a question of when does the snow fall, mm. right? So, like, say that generally you'd have to open in October. Um, you will get super cold clouds in say like the San Juan mountains in Colorado in September, um, particularly late September that could precipitate if only they had more aerosol in them. So it's a question of how much earlier in the season can you get the resort open? How much later in the season can you extend the, the Mm -hmm. uh, slopes viability? And then how many tickets do you sell in that Delta of time? Right. That's, that's the foremost consideration. And then also say you have like a particularly warm spell, um, how much, how much money do we save from not running our snow blowers? Right. Because mm. actual snow is higher quality. It's dispersed more uniformly over the mountain. So you don't have certain tracks that have it, certain tracks that don't. Um, these are sort of the three things that go into consideration when we're negotiating with ski resorts. So not only it, it, with these ski resorts, with the farms, but then what about like the government? Could the government come to you? And like, it's kind of feeds into one of my questions I've been dying to ask you. I don't know why I've never asked you this before. Why are meteorologists wrong all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I love meteorologists. Dude. They're awesome. It's a hard job. I get it. But like the joke, especially in like small towns, yeah. right? Is like, hey, you said it was going to rain today. It hadn't rained in a month, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah, type yeah. thing. Like, so maybe talk a little bit as to, you know, why is that a hard job? And then sure. is the government potentially a customer as well? Yeah, totally. So, um, like fluid, fluid modeling fluids is a complicated business. The atmosphere is a fluid. There's, multiple different viscosities between different clouds, um, different water content therein. Um, it's, it's a complicated thing and we don't have like infinite compute to do that sort of modeling. Um, so there's just the, the systemic problem that it, it is literally just really complicated. Um, and then it's, it's part of what makes it hard is we're pretty good at microphysical models, meaning like, okay, how does every particle interact in a system? And we're pretty okay at, like dynamic scale models, like synoptic scale models of, okay, how over the entire globe is this one particular weather pattern going to move? Um, but nobody's ever done a good job of connecting these two. Mm. So you have no mesoscale, you, you have no mapping of, of micro to macro scale and the mesoscale. And that's kind of why you get like a, a low quality forecast generally. Um, and it's getting better with time, but, but mapping like how do these particles interact to how does the entire globe's atmosphere interact? Um, that's like a compute problem for one, um, a modeling problem for two. Uh, and then it's just generally complicated. Now that being said, um, meteorology being unsexy, right. For the last, I don't know, 80 years ish or, well, actually I think one of the few things meteorology is, is actually probably sexy, right. Given, the weather channel and whatever, but, um, it not attracting like 
tons of investment and stuff to this effect. Um, that has just resulted in like a dearth of interest and resource being allocated to these problems. Um, because, you know, like what's the benefit of better forecasting? Like in the case of hedge funds, it's very clear. So some of the best quants end up at hedge funds to do like commodities trading based on weather forecasts. But um, the science itself sort of left unaddressed just because uh, there hasn't been a clear mission to justify and clear like value prop to justify deeper research. Um, I think that's going to change. I agree. But I might think of it for different reasons than you. Fox mm. uh, News Corp, mm -hmm. they made a big investment in weather. Mm. And my guess is that uh, climate change mm -hmm. is obviously a hotly debated political topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to see both political parties and like their uh, kind of ensuing media uh, outlets that lean different ways, all heavily investing in weather because it mm -hmm. actually feeds into news coverage and politics mm -hmm. more than it did 15 years ago. This tracks. Um, and like on one hand, that's probably great in terms of like there'll be more coverage. Uh, on the other hand, like if it's politicized, mm -hmm. that might not actually be the best. No. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. And, and so like, you know, you could easily see the incentives taking us down a, you know, bad route of like, actually, if you measure over here, the temperature of the earth <laughs> yeah, is a little yeah, bit yeah, different yeah, than exactly, over here. Exactly, totally. Just have to be a little bit of shade, but. Dude. Yeah, studying data science at Cal, one of the biggest takeaways is like you can make data say almost whatever you want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, I remember seeing at one point somebody was like, you could cool the earth if you painted half of like, I don't know, the Sahara Desert white or something. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Right. They were like, yeah, uh, it like, that. It'd like hold the heat or whatever yeah, the thing yeah, was. And I remember just being like, how y'all going to do that? <laughs> like, you know, like lay down like boards and like paint them white or something, you know, like, yeah. like uh, whatever. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's just going to become more politicized. Are you, are you into like mega projects? Like, do you think about mega projects like painting the Sahara white or like, uh, well, uh, I'm probably more up to date on like some of the ones that, uh, people are already attempting. Mm -hmm. So for example, like, uh, the Palm Islands or whatever, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, the line. Neon. Um, yeah. yeah. So like those, uh, I mean, I think they're interesting and like, we'll see, you know, how hard it is to get built. Um, I think in the United States, like, I don't know, we, we should just like fix the bridges and roads. Right. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah, like yeah, sure. we, we haven't earned the right yet to do the mega projects. <laughs> sure. Like, Probably, cause yeah. we're not doing the, you know, blocking and tackling yeah. of like the basics. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, maybe it's just like cooler to see everyone else, like be super aspirational, but you're like, well, we don't even have like high speed rail. Yeah. You know, one yeah, of my favorite yeah, data sure. points around infrastructure is that uh, the bright line in uh, Florida mm -hmm. is the first profitable rail line in all of America, I think. And it's privately owned. The guys at Fortress mm. bought it like back okay. in like, mid 2000s or something. Um, and it's like the idea of a rail line being profitable in America was like impossible. Yeah. Folklore, right? Yeah. Like, like just like, <laughs> yeah. you, oh, back in the day, they used to be profitable. Uh -huh. uh, but like that shows that it's possible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's kind of why I asked earlier, like could the government do this or do we actually need private companies to go do it? And it's probably, yeah, we do need private companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, th I think that there's public interest in, you know, in the same way that like, I don't know, the DOD doesn't manufacture all their munitions, right? Like NOAA shouldn't necessarily conduct all of their weather mod themselves, mm -hmm. but like contracting that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what are you most looking forward to? Like you're building a company, so you, you have to be excited about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you've recruited people to come work with you. So you have to be enthusiastic and, you know, uh, uh kind of compelling to get them mm. to come work with you. But what are you most excited about? Mm. You know, I, yeah, I talk to my friends about this a lot. Like I do not think that there's anything. Yeah. It, it sounds trite to say, um, I think that like, I talk, I've talked about this before, Genesis 128, right? Like God giving man dominion over the earth, the seas, and, and the skies. Um, I hope that by the end of my life, the world that I grew up in looks more like the kingdom of heaven on earth um, than, you know, it did when I was born. So practically, 
people being less famished, people starving less, having more biodiversity, not having to worry about the sort of like ecological and climatological collapse that all of Gen Z is poisoned by. Like, that's really the end state that I want to see. I want to see the Great Plains, you know, a few million acres larger by the end of my life in West Texas and New Mexico and so on. Um, that I'm really excited about in the long term. I think in the short term, though, um, and this this was evident on the dude bus, if you followed the infamous dude bus. Oh, I followed. Yeah. <laughs> in real time. Couldn't yeah. help it. It was just <laughs> stuffed down my feed <laughs> yeah, 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 of photos. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Um, I loved it. Like, I, what I'm on the very short horizon optimistic about and excited about is like, um, tech is something that we're excited to be participating in again. Um, we're optimistic about the prospects of it. Everybody wants to take huge bets. Um, I'm excited to see like Gen Z and Gen Alpha um, more aggressively pursue like their vision for the future than I think previous generations have. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're not motivated by money. I don't think that we're not rebelling from the status quo. Like every generation kind of does that. It's trite to say that we're different. Um, I think though the pendulum has swung in such a way that like, we're, we're sick of doomerism in a way that is compelling action way more uh, manifestly than it has in previous generations. So that mm -hmm. I'm excited to see. Like all of my mm -hmm. friends are zealots for a better future. Mm -hmm. um, so that I'm excited about um, this summer. I want to go back to Muscle Beach and lift there um, <laughs> when it's warm. It is cool. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is cool. Um, and then if you're successful... Can you do this like all over the United States, all over the world? Can you compete against China or you know any other country? Will they let you modify their weather? Like, how do you think about what is the upper limit of success for Rainmaker? Uh, uh, like a garden planet is what it looks like. Uh, a, an Earth that is more habitable and more biodiverse and more lush than it ever has been as long as humanity has been on the face of it. Mm -hmm. um, you can do weather mod for the benefit of environments and people all over the United States, all over the world. And so what it looks like first is probably as we have started watershed supplementation in, in the West, then severe storm mitigation over the mm -hmm. rest of the country as necessary. Then, you know, in Canada, they have hail suppression contracts that we'll probably try to look into and work with. Um, Mexico, et cetera. Uh, the European climate is actually pretty solid. Like they don't need a whole lot of modification there, especially in the med, maybe more rain in, in some areas. Actually, there's some vineyards in the South of France that look awesome. Um, if you never, if I fall off the face of the earth and nobody ever hears from me again, it's because Rainmaker became a lifestyle business and I just started hanging out in vineyards in Marseille, <laughs> um, which I won't do, but it's funny to talk about. Um, so it looks like it looks like weather mod over the entire United States and then everywhere in the world. Um, I think that, you know, this is a political question, a geopolitical one. There are reasons why certain countries want to protect strategic industries of national interest. Um, so will China let us modify the weather there? Um, I think that if it, I would, I would, I hope for a future where we can collaborate with our current rivals and adversaries so tightly that we can export our business into their nations. Um, that I do, I do hope for. Um, in the interim though, uh, yeah, everywhere that is aligned in the world, we hope to make more abundant and lush, um, ultimately resulting in like a, a more habitable planet, a, a terraform planet, one that is free from inclement weather and uh, is as abundant as ever before. My last question for you is, uh, is there going to be a day where you have like a bat phone and like governors of, you know, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana are calling you and like the hurricane's coming, like come save us. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, like it sounds um, crazy, but there is a path where that could be a thing. Uh, I, I, I would be blessed to have the opportunity to do that for, uh, say Mayor Francis Suarez or something. I, I'll happily share my number with him if ever Miami's in need of aid. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> where can we send people to find you uh, on the internet? You're not hard to find, but uh, where, sure. where, where should we send uh, you? On, on Twitter, I'm A Dorico at A-D-O-R-I-C-K-O. Um, and then uh, the website for the company is makerain.com. Make rain. What a wild world we live in. Exciting times, man.
I'm betting on you. Don't, don't fuck this <laughs> up. <laughs> All right, we'll do it again soon. Cool. Thanks, brother.